Okay, so we've talked about what runoff and what runoff is. Today, this presentation is going to be about controlling runoff and things that we can do to manage excess runoff. Your instructions are just to listen, and as the video goes on, you define all the key vocabulary terms that are usually pointed out for you on the screen. In addition, you must take some notes that explains the main concepts that are presented. So here we've got precipitation. And remember that water from precipitation does one of two things when it hits the ground. It either infiltrates, goes into the ground and becomes part of groundwater, or it moves across the surface as runoff water, which is any water that doesn't infiltrate and moves across the surface. The question becomes, how much of all of this water is going to infiltrate and how much is going to become runoff? And that's determined by a couple factors. One of the most important factors is what is the ground like? Natural ground allows for a lot of infiltration. Something like that, a lot of water can go into the ground because there's nothing to stop it. The problem is roads and sidewalks and buildings. Those are impervious surfaces. An impervious surface is anything that water cannot go through to get to the ground. So that would be a pervious surface, the natural surface. That is an impervious surface. Impervious surfaces make all of the rain that falls become runoff, as you can see by this roof here. Every drop of water that hits this roof is just running off and it's going to go somewhere as opposed to that surface right there. You notice you don't see any water running out of the pine straw because the water there is able to infiltrate. About 90% of the water that hits a natural surface will go into the ground. 100% of the water that hits an impervious surface is going to run off and going to go somewhere else and the problem becomes all of that water from our impervious services has got to go somewhere because we are now not letting that water go into the ground naturally so we have disrupted that natural flow of water in the water cycle the next step to this equation is well what do we do with all of that extra runoff out there where does it go and how do we handle it so that it doesn't cause flooding somewhere else? So that's the whole point of this presentation is what do, what happens to all that extra runoff water from all the impervious surfaces? It's got to go somewhere and it will naturally want to flow downhill to the lowest point. Consider this area here, Centennial High School. You see the Centennial Kroger and you see Holcomb Bridge Road right here. I want you to think about a drop of rain that falls on Kroger's parking lot. It's going to want to go downhill to the lowest point. Well, if you can visualize this area, the lowest points over here, say the corner of Eves and Holcomb Bridge Road. Well, we've got a lot of parking lots and a lot of roads. Imagine if with every rainstorm, all of the water winds up down here in this lowest point, because that's where it's gonna wanna go naturally. It's gonna wanna slide downhill to the lowest point. That could be a problem. Because our intersection at Eves and Holcomb Bridge Road would look like this. And we can't drive through that. We can't have traffic move through there. So this is why we have to manage runoff because we want to keep it from building up places where we don't want it. So we got to manage it. The question now becomes how. And the whole point of this presentation is we're going to look at some things, some ways that we can use to manage and control all that excess runoff. So consider this scene here when it rains. Water from the sky falls as precipitation. When it hits the ground, it only has two choices. It either infiltrates or it runs off. Well, water that hits a natural surface will infiltrate into the ground. The problem in, th in this scene is we've got a roof, we've got a driveway, we've got a street, which are all called impervious surfaces. They don't allow water to go into the ground, and instead, all of the water becomes runoff. Well, we've seen that too much runoff can be a problem. 
we can't let all of the water that would hit every house and every street and every driveway in this neighborhood go to the river because it would cause flooding. So the question becomes, what do we do with all this excess runoff? How do we control it and manage it so that it doesn't cause us problems? In the case of a roof, we're going to collect all that water with the gutters and we're going to run it down this downspout. And at the bottom, we're going to point it away from the house because we don't want the water to infiltrate here near our house because then it might seep in through the concrete walls. So we're going to run that water off. We're going to encourage it to slide down the driveway and go towards the street. So now the water's at the street and you'll typically see it running down one of these little channels right next to the street. And the question now becomes, well, where does it go from here? At some point on the street, that channel is going to carry that water and we're going to see it disappear into this object here. This right here is called a storm drain. This is not a sewer. Make a point to know that this is a storm drain. It carries storm water runoff. It carries runoff from precipitation. So the water comes down the street and runs into this and in there there's a pipe that will take this storm water somewhere where it won't cause problems. It gets it off of our street, gets it away from our houses so we don't have seepage problems and takes it someplace where we can hold on to it and it won't cause us problems. That device, that storm drain, is not connected to that house. There is no water that goes from that house directly into that storm drain. If you were to crawl in there and go backwards in the pipe, you will not stick up your head into somebody's toilet. Toilet water, drainage water from a house, is handled differently. A storm drain only collects runoff water from precipitation. And the difference is runoff water is clean water. It doesn't have any poop in it or pee in it or chemicals in it. So it's clean water that we just need to put somewhere and let it get back into the water cycle naturally. Now this on the other hand, notice this is labeled sewer. This is out in the middle of the street and it is not connected to those drains along, along the edge of the curb. This is a sewer, and a sewer is meant to handle dirty water, poopy water. If you were to crawl down in there and manage to go into the pipes and work your way backwards, your head would pop out into somebody's toilet, shower, or sink, because that water is dirty water. When you flush the toilet, it runs from your house, through a pipe, and will run to here. This water is dirty, and it needs to be clean before it goes back in the water cycle. The water running down the street is precipitation. It's runoff. It's clean water. It doesn't have to be treated. So instead of having to clean all of the water, we have separate systems. You have a storm drain, which handles runoff, precipitation water, which is clean. And you have sewers, which handle dirty, poopy water that needs to be cleaned before it goes back in the water cycle. So, water gets in the storm drain. It rains, runs off the street, goes in the storm drain. The question now becomes, where does it go? Well, first and foremost, water from storm drains goes right back into the river. And that's okay because it's precipitation. It's water that would normally flow into a river anyway. So, it's okay for runoff water to go into a river or stream because it's clean and it's not going to pollute my river. Matter of fact, on a lot of storm drains, you'll see signs like this, though, that say, hey, be careful, don't pollute here, because this, this water is going straight to the Chattahoochee River. So you have to be careful about what, what goes in that storm drain, because whatever gets washed down in there with the water will wind up in the river. So you should be very careful about things like trash going into a storm drain. And you should never, ever do something like this. You shouldn't pour old oil or chemicals into a storm drain, because there's a good chance that that water is going to wind up in the river and pollute our rivers. You also have to be careful with how clogged up storm drains get. We really want to avoid a situation like this where our storm drains get clogged with either this leaves and dirt because then when it rains the water backs up here and we get flooding in the street because the water can't make its way into the storm drain. 
This happens in Atlanta every time it rains around the interstates. The storm drains get clogged. The water can't get off the road fast enough because the storm drains are clogged, either with trash or leaves or whatever, and the water backs up, and we wind up with some road flooding. Obviously, you can't drive on that. Now, yes, we can send storm water to the river, but we can't send it all. Rivers and streams can't hold or move all of our runoff water, especially with the amount of impervious surfaces that we've made in this city. This is what will happen. Here's my river over here. Here's my normal place where the water is moving. And this could be a situation where it rained real heavy and we had a lot of extra runoff go into the river and the river couldn't hold it. And so the water ends up coming out of the river and ends up being out here where the houses are, which I don't want. This situation here has a name. This is what we call a flood. A flood is any time surface water escapes its normal boundaries. Normal boundaries, it's in the stream, it's in the river. When it comes out of a stream or a river, that's a flood. So we can't send all the water to the river and it'll cause flooding. So we need something else to do. Let's look at some options that we can do with excess runoff from the storm drains that we can't send all the way to the river. So here we've got a shopping center with lots of building, lots of parking lot. Those are all impervious surfaces. That means when water falls from the sky, hits the building or the parking lot, it can't go into the ground and infiltrate like it would have naturally. So we wind up with a bunch of excess runoff water that we have to do something with. Because if we don't, it's gonna go to the river and cause flooding because it's more water then the river can handle naturally. So the question becomes, what do we do with all of this excess runoff? Well, the most common thing that happens is it runs across the parking lot and it winds up in something like this. You know, this is a storm drain. This will get the water off my parking lot and take it into there and it goes into a pipe and I can move that water somewhere where it won't cause problems. The question becomes, where? Where do we put all of this excess water? Where does the water on the other end of the storm drain go. The most common place that the runoff water went was an area like this. It's kind of a little low lying area where the water fills up. This is a pond. More specifically, this is called a retention pond. It retains the water and it doesn't allow the water to go to the river and cause flooding. So once again, a retention pond is some place where we allow excess water to go and kind of hang out. And one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to infiltrate into the ground or it will evaporate back up into the sky. Now there are some distinct disadvantages to using retention ponds. And these were the most common and probably easiest way to handle excess runoff water for years. But one of the problems is anything that comes off the parking lot comes into this retention pond with the water and you can see there's a fair amount of trash down there and any leaves and dirt and such will also wind up in this retention pond which means it fills up well retention ponds when they fill up with dirt and leaves and trash they can't hold as much water and that's what I need them for so retention ponds have to be cleaned out periodically which is expensive and it's a hassle a second disadvantage to retention ponds is all of that standing water it looks kind of swampy, kind of dirty, kind of nasty. It is. They smell. They breed mosquitoes. They're not pretty to look at. A final disadvantage of retention ponds is their size. I had to allot a fair amount of space to build this retention pond. For this shopping center, they have two of these, and this is actually the smaller of the two. So I've got this dirty, nasty, garbage-filled receptacle of stinky water that I had to waste a lot of space on. So even though retention ponds were very, very common and they work, we're now going to look at some better options for managing our excess runoff than retention ponds. So this here is an example of a retention pond that we actually have here on Centennial's campus. And the story behind this goes is this part of the building here, the J100 Hall, was added onto the school later. And when the school board went to get permission to build this, well, the city of Roswell said, you've got a lot more impervious services now, which is gonna cause more runoff. What are you going to do with it? And they had to come up with a plan. And the plan was, 
we'll take the water off of the roof and we'll dump it into this little holding area here so that it doesn't end up going down the street and eventually to the Chattahoochee River. Well, what's the water do when it gets here? Remember, it either infiltrates into the ground or it will evaporate up into the sky. And we've actually got some plants in there to actually help some drink up some of the water and put it back in the air. So once again, this is an example of a retention pond that we have right here on Centennial's campus to help manage the extra runoff water when we build new parts to the school. All right, what you're looking at here is the main retention pond for Centennial High School. And this retention pond was put in in 1997 when they built the school as a place for all the excess runoff water off the building and the parking lots to go. So up there is the tennis courts and the rest of the school and over there is the practice field. And every storm drain from the main part of the campus leads to this point right here. And the water after a rainstorm will come out and wind up over there in the retention pond. Now you can see the size of this area. It's pretty big. There's a lot of wasted space here on our campus that we have to allow just as a place for excess stormwater to go. So, just to summarize retention ponds, you get the idea, water runs off and it goes somewhere and it hangs out. A retention pond is just a place for excess runoff water to go from a storm drain and be set aside so that it doesn't cause flooding where we don't want extra water. So what you see back here behind me is called Martin's Lake, which is the big lake in the middle of the Martin's Landing subdivision right close to the school. And this is a really, really, really big neighborhood with lots of houses and lots of roads and lots of other buildings. And when they built this and they put in all these houses, they created a lot of extra runoff. And as we've talked about before, you've got to have a plan to manage that extra runoff. And here's what they did. They ran it all into this area here. So basically this Martin's Lake is just a really big, fancy retention pond. As a matter of fact, most of the ponds and lakes that we have in our local neighborhoods are nothing more than fancy retention ponds. Because before this neighborhood was built, this was all woods and trees and plants and the water would have infiltrated the ground. But once they built the houses and the streets and the roads and the parking lots, all of that extra runoff was going to end up going that way, which is where the Chattahoochee River is. Now you can imagine if all of this extra water wound up in the river, we would have a lot of really serious flooding problems. So once again, retention ponds are built to hold excess runoff water. So on this map, all these little blue dots are basically retention ponds. Every little neighborhood, subdivision, apartment complex, if you see a body of water, associated with them. They weren't built there for looks. They were built there to handle excess runoff from all the new impervious surfaces. So any developed area, you build a parking lot, a road, building anything, you get man-made impervious surfaces. You've got to have something to manage the extra runoff. Otherwise, you're going to get flooding. So here I am outside of Tampa, Florida, and you know it rains a lot in Florida. Well, if you look at this area that I'm in, there's some big parking lots and sidewalks and big roads and buildings with lots of impervious surfaces. So when all that rain hits the ground, it is going to run off. And the question becomes, what do you do with it? Well, in Georgia, we would run all of that excess water into a storm drain and carry it to a retention pond and let it hang out there. Well, in Florida, they do something a little bit different. What you see in this picture is just a big, huge drainage ditch right beside the road. And what happens is the water just goes in that drainage ditch and it's allowed just to sit right there. And you can see it sitting right there. The reason they can do this in Florida is because the ground is so sandy. This ground is almost entirely sand. And as you know, water goes through sand very easily. So all of this water is eventually going to drain right into the ground or on a nice sunny day where it's hot like it is in Florida, the water's going to evaporate. Either way, 
the water kind of takes care of itself. Now, we can't do this in Georgia because our ground is primarily made of clay and our ground is really really steep so the water is going to run off someplace else it's going to go to that lowest point well in florida every place is pretty much the same low point so the water can just sit in place in florida it can infiltrate into the ground whereas in georgia with all of this being clay the water would just sit there forever and then the next time it rains more water would be on top of the old water and before you know it we've got a little mini flood and my road is flooded so in Florida, typically, they're going to use things like drainage ditches a lot more than they would use storm drains because the water infiltrates the ground so easily because of the sandy soil. And you can see this all over Florida. The next time you'll go, you'll notice they don't have nearly as many storm drains. And it's not because it rains less. It's just because their water goes into the ground a lot more easily because it's sand. So a drainage ditch, let's kind of define what this is. It's kind of self-explanatory. It's basically just a low point where water is allowed to go and hang out so that it doesn't flood somewhere else. You typically see these beside roads or any other place that you want the water to get off of. We have one here at Centennial. It's kind of there beside the baseball field. We want the water to get off the baseball field pretty quick. And there's a little drainage ditch right there beside it where we allow the water. It's the low point. We allow the water to go from the baseball field and go into that drainage ditch. We don't necessarily need, need to build a storm drain there because we're not talking about as much water as you would have, say, off of a parking lot or a major road. Now, there's some distinct disadvantages that I mentioned before. First and foremost is retention ponds take up a lot of space. Look at the size of this and look at the size of this. That's a lot of space that you have to allow just to hold excess water. The second disadvantage is they're kind of nasty. They're ugly. They smell bad. They get filled with trash. They're not pretty. So typically retention ponds are built in the back of shopping centers or kind of out of sight. So second big disadvantage, they're dirty, they're nasty, they're smelly, uh, they're ugly. The third disadvantage of retention ponds is they have to be cleaned out because they fill up with so much trash that over time they can't hold as much water and you need them to hold water. So you have to maintain retention ponds. You have to go in there, you have to clean them out every so often and that of course is expensive and time consuming. So let's look at some alternatives. What can we do that's different than a retention pond? And you're going to start seeing some of this newer stuff, even in our area. So here we've got a big shopping center, which is a big building, big parking lot. And every drop of rain that's going to fall on that building or this parking lot is going to become runoff because it cannot get through this surface into the ground. Remember that buildings and parking lots are what we call impervious surfaces that water can't get through to get into the ground. Well, all of this extra runoff has to go somewhere and it has to be managed. Well, most of that runoff, we're gonna run into something like this called a storm drain. And we're gonna run it through a pipe and we're gonna take that storm water somewhere and have to hold on to it so that it doesn't get into the river and cause flooding. Usually that's a retention pond. The problem with this is I gotta build a pipe from here and I got to allow some land for a retention pond. I got to hold on to that water for a long time. Well, this Target shopping center is trying something new and different, a little bit better alternative to building storm drains. So what they've done is build what's called a bioswale. A bioswale is a low lying area that's filled with plants that allows for the absorption and infiltration of precipitation. Now the water still hits this parking lot, but it runs off and instead of going into a storm drain, you see it's allowed to go through this opening here and it goes into this low lying area. And you see we've got some trees and we've got some plants here. And two things happen to this water. It either goes into the ground as infiltration, which is what it would have done before we built the parking lot, 
or these plants are going to help soak up the water through their leaves from the soil and the water is then going to go back up into the sky via evaporation. So once again, this is called a bioswale. A bioswale is a low-lying area filled with plants that helps in managing excess runoff. So this is the new band room at Centennial. And this part of the building was added on after the school was originally built in 1997. And when the school board went to the city of Roswell and said, hey, we want to build this new building, give us permission to build it. One of the first things the city of Roswell said was, well, what are you going to do with the extra runoff? Because this is a building and all the water that hits that building is now going to become runoff. What are you going to do with it? Well, here's what was done. Originally, these were all parking spaces in here. But in order to handle the extra runoff that was caused by the new building, the construction company and the school board agreed to put in this little low-lying area here and fill it full of plants. And when it rains, the water is going to go in there and it's going to hang out in this area. And it will either infiltrate the ground or the plants drink it up and release it into the air. So this is an example of a bioswale that we had to put in on our campus when we built the new building that would have caused extra runoff. And the city of Roswell is very proactive about making you do stuff like this in order to handle the extra runoff from new construction. Here's the bioswale after a rainstorm and you can see it works. You can see the excess water goes in there and it hangs out. That bioswale, I've never seen water in it for much longer than a day because it works because the water goes into the ground so quickly and the plants drink it up and spit it back into the air via tra transpiration. Well, more recently than building the new band room was this addition that was put onto the front of the school, this extra little portico or lobby. And to build it, you had to get a building permit. You went to the city of Roswell and said, hey, we want to build this new part to the school. It's a little bit more roof, so there's a little more runoff. And the city of Roswell said, okay, you can build it, but show us a plan that you have to manage some extra runoff. And here's what the builder and the school system agreed to do. They made this little low-lying area here. They dug this out in the front of the school. This didn't used to be here. And you can see what happens, water will run off the parking lot, which is an impervious surface, and comes down and hangs out in here. All of the water that runs off the parking lot and comes in here doesn't wind up in the river and won't cause flooding. So this is an example of how you can manage some excess runoff water, and it is required. So all of those things are options to control excess runoff and to prevent flooding. But what if we could prevent runoff from even happening? Then we wouldn't have to do all that stuff. Now, we can't make it rain any less. But what if we can make less water become runoff? Here's some options that actually decreases the amount of water that actually will become runoff during a rainstorm. Okay, so here we've got a CVS, a building and we've got a big parking lot which are nothing more than impervious surfaces and every time rain comes down out of the sky it hits these surfaces and it has to go somewhere because it can't get into the ground most cases it goes into that storm drain and we have to take it somewhere and hold on to it so it doesn't cause flooding in the river well now this CVS did something a little bit different with their parking lot to help manage the excess runoff caused by the building in the parking lot and they built this right here. They made part of their parking lot what's called a permeable parking lot. Permeable, remember, it means that it allows water to go into the ground. And you can see this, that it's got the ground in between these pavers. So when it rains over here, the water can get back into the ground and infiltrate instead of becoming runoff. So this is another way that we can help manage excess runoff. It's by making what we call porous or permeable pavement which allows water to infiltrate the ground and lessens the amount of runoff that we have to manage. So let's look at something else that can be done 
that will help allow water to infiltrate the ground, whereas it might have normally become runoff that we would have to manage with retention ponds and storm drains. So how can we lessen the actual amount of water that becomes runoff? Well, you can use something like this. This is an example of a material called a porous or a permeable paver. You see those terms interchangeably, and although they mean different things, they work the same way when managing runoff. Something that is porous has a lot of open spaces in it, and something that is permeable will allow water to go through it. So here's a material that they can actually use to pave a surface, as opposed to regular asphalt or concrete, which is an entirely solid material. You'll notice this has a lot of open spaces in it. So when it rains and water hits this, the water can kind of hang out in the open spaces in between. That means less water runs across the surface and it's less water that we have to manage somehow. So that's an example of what we call a porous paver. You can also call these a permeable paver because water will move through them very easily. Something like this. And you can see almost as fast as I pour the water into it, the water goes through it. So this would be water that then is now allowed to go into the ground as opposed to becoming runoff that I have to manage. So this is a good solution as to how we can make less runoff. Now, there are limitations with this. You can see it's not a very solid material, which means that it can't be used everywhere. We can't pave a road with this stuff because a big heavy truck or cars that move very fast are gonna squish it too quickly and break it down. Good applications of stuff like this are places where you don't get a lot of heavy use. Your driveway or a parking lot, especially a parking lot that's not used every day. Something say like church on Sunday, where you only have cars and not big trucks, but you only have cars that use the surface about once a week. So think about the size of a church parking lot and how much of the water would become runoff that the church would then have to build a retention pond for or a storm drain system. If you have something like this, this is gonna allow the water to go directly into the ground like it would have naturally, and it's less water, less runoff water that you have to manage and fool with. You see some of these being used at places um, around Metro Atlanta, because uh, here we have some serious uh, management of runoff problems because we get a lot of rain, we have a lot of development. This is a Wendy's in Covington, Georgia. Now you'll notice the drive-through lane is over here and it's paved in asphalt, regular asphalt. But over here they had parking spaces that were the porous concrete. They couldn't make the drive-through out of that because it just gets too much use. And while I was there, I decided I would do a little experiment. I took the same cup of water and I poured it on the asphalt. You'll notice what happened. It all immediately started to run off. Whereas here, the water soaked through the porous concrete and went into the ground. Another example, instead of using that, that concrete, you can just use just plain gravel. You'll see this some places and that allows water to go through it. Now, one of the biggest causes of runoff are buildings, the roofs of buildings, which generate an incredible amount of runoff because no water goes into a building during a rainstorm. It all becomes runoff. And generally what we do is we run it off the building and we run it down to the street into our storm drain system. Well, the problem is we've got too many more new houses here in Atlanta. We've got too many more streets. We're having too much runoff. And we don't maybe want to spend the land to build a big, stinky, nasty looking retention pond. So there are some options to do some other things with what we call runoff from houses, from our gutters and our downspouts. If you live in a place that has the right soil, <coughs> you can run the downspout, the gutters, straight under the ground and just let that water go straight to the ground as opposed to across the driveway. Now. This honestly is not a great option for us here in Georgia because for us in Georgia, we have clay down here and the water coming off of our downspouts wouldn't go into the clay quick enough. But if you have sand, sandy soil, 
this is a great option to reduce the amount of runoff that's going into my street and has to be carried by my storm drain. Now, here in Georgia, you'll see these gaining in popularity now. These are called a rain barrel. A rain barrel is just meant to ca catch and store runoff water from a roof. It keeps it out of the storm drain. And then there's also water that you can use for other purposes. Now, you can't drink it. It's not connected to your house. But what you can do is you can water your garden, you can water your plants, you can water your lawn with it. And once again, it keeps excess runoff from going to the storm drain. <coughs> there are some places, especially places that don't have a lot of extra water, that are experimenting with catching runoff from a roof, running the downspout into the soil, and running it into a tank where they store it. And then they take that water and they use it in the house. Now, you can't drink that water because who knows what's run off the roof. It's not 100% clean and drinkable, but you could certainly use it to flush your toilet. You could use it even to take a shower. So this is a way that we conserve water and we cut down on the amount of runoff water that we have to manage somewhere else now a green roof we talked about these in the fall semester we talked about how these help keep cities from getting too hot they also help manage runoff water because now water that falls and hits this rooftop here is hitting a natural surface and hitting plants that are going to help to soak up the water and then put it back into the air via transpiration. Whereas if that were a traditional metal roof or shingle roof or solid uh, surface, the water would just run off the edge of the building. We'd have to collect it and do something with it. So these green roofs have more advantages than we realize. So here's some of the key vocabulary and concepts. You should ask yourself these questions. Do you know or did you get the answers to or the explanation for these questions? These are the main key ideas that were presented.